Hello everyone. Today uh, we're going to talk about cells and movement and there is a quiz over this on its learning. Um, although it's not quite like you're used to, it's not doesn't follow directly along with the activity, the quiz is specifically over osmosis and diffusion. So you're, you're welcome to have that up while you're watching this, uh, but really you need to pay very good attention to what I'm going to explain in here. Um, you're welcome to take some notes, that will probably help you as well. Uh, ask questions if you don't understand. We're getting into some material that's a little bit more complex here, so uh, take your time with it uh, and make sure you understand before you try to do the quiz. But the quiz is specifically over osmosis and diffusion, and a little bit on the cell membrane too. So let's dive into cells and movement here. Uh, the first thing we're going to talk about is what's known as passive transport, right? So uh, first of all, in your mind, you should already be thinking, you know, if there's something called passive transport, there must be probably something called active transport. And you're right, there is. Uh, but first up is passive transport. So what passive transport is, is any way a cell has of transporting material uh, into it or out of it without needing any energy to do that. Okay, so the cell can do this free of charge. It just sort of happens naturally. Um, there's two main types of this. Uh, one is called diffusion and the other is called facilitated diffusion. So uh, none of these require any energy, remember, keep in mind, and all of these have to do with moving materials into the cell. To get into the cell you have to go through this thing called a cell membrane. That's just the membrane that surrounds every cell and keeps it separate from its external environment. So part of being alive is maintaining what we call homeostasis or a stable internal environment and that holds true for a giant organism like ourselves or even a single celled creature like an amoeba so every single cell has to maintain this balance of materials inside of itself um, and it does that by having a membrane that keeps some things out but allows other things in. So right now we're going to talk about things that can just move across that membrane easily, okay? And then we'll get into the membrane a little bit as we go. Um, now along with this there's another word in here you're going to see called osmosis. I'm going to explain this again here in a second, but osmosis is really just a special type of diffusion. It doesn't require any energy um, and it does involve the movement of water across the membrane. Okay, so we're going to dive in here with diffusion, then we'll talk through osmosis, facilitated diffusion, and whatnot. But we're talking about stuff moving into and out of a cell. So, what is diffusion? What diffusion is, is simply put, the process where particles move from an area of higher concentration to an area of lower concentration. That's a question right on, going to be on your quiz today. So from high to low. Um, this, is, this is pretty simple to, to remember because if you think about it, if you pack a whole bunch of something in one corner of a room and then set it free, uh, it's going to spread out to all corners of the room until it's kind of even, right? So things move from, <coughs> excuse me, what we call a high concentration gradient where there's a whole bunch of stuff on one side to the low concentration where there's not as much stuff until things even out. Um, this, this happens in the air, like for instance if you were to spray some perfume in the corner of a room, we all know that after a while people in the middle of the room would start to smell it. People in that corner would smell it right away, right? And then p eventually people in the farthest corners of the room would start to smell the perfume. It would spread around. Um, in fact, even with, if we weren't running the air conditioner and blowing any air around or having a fan, just the random motion of air molecules alone would help to spread it out all over the place until it was evenly spread and at what we call equilibrium. In other words, it's equal, right? So you're going to hear a lot of words um, like concentration gradient, equilibrium, the bells, um, things like that uh, that you're just going to have to start to get a handle on and get used to. So this is this process of diffusion, simple diffusion, is really the way an awful lot of stuff moves across the cell membrane. Okay, so let's look at a picture here and it hopefully it will make a little bit more sense. If you look at the top picture on the left, there's a whole bunch of molecules. Maybe um, maybe this is a liquid environment and that's that's salt or something like that. Okay, and then there's a membrane that happens to let it through. 
okay? So the salt molecules move through that membrane and get to the other side. Maybe salt's not the best example because salt usually can't get through a semipermeable membrane. So let's say it's air. And the little green molecules up there happen to be, I don't know, maybe some perfume molecules that we just sprayed, right? In those perfume molecules, they're really packed into one side of the room where you sprayed them, but eventually they spread out through the other side of the room, and it's going to look like it does in the bottom picture, right? So that bottom picture, I want you to notice something else. Even though, even once things are at equilibrium, in other words, it's balanced on both sides of a membrane or throughout the whole room if there's even no membrane, um, those molecules are going to continue to move back and forth. Okay, so just because something's at equilibrium doesn't mean that the movement of the molecules has ceased. They just move both directions equally and it stays nice and equal like that. Okay, so with diffusion, uh, this word equilibrium that I keep saying just means that the concentration of the substance on both sides of the cell membrane is the same. Now something else about diffusion. I don't want you to get confused here because of the way this is worded in the pictures that are up here. Diffusion doesn't necessarily require a membrane, right? like, like the separation between the outside of the cell and the inside of the cell. Yes, that's a membrane, but my room, if we spray perfume in my room, there's no membrane in my room. There's no like separation anywhere. It's just all open, right? And diffusion absolutely is taking place there. If I have a big bucket of water and I drop some food coloring into a corner of the bucket, there's no membrane inside the bucket but the food coloring is going to spread out throughout the entire bucket until it's kind of evenly spread everywhere. You won't even be able to tell that it's in there anymore, right? Um, so diffusion doesn't require a membrane, but it, it, it does go through membranes, right? Just because uh, we're talking about cells here. So in the picture there, you've got molecules of dye on one side, and it just so happens these things can pass through this, whatever this membrane is here. It's got holes big enough to allow them through, and the holes, the molecules move on through the membrane and, and spread until things are equal. And then they keep moving back and forth. It's a pretty simple concept, right? Let's move forward to facilitated diffusion. So if you think what a facilitator is, a facilitator is like maybe a person in, in a meeting that keeps the meeting moving forward, like uh, helps the meeting move along. So you can think of these facilitated diffusion things as, um, as it's just diffusion that needs a little bit of help, okay? It needs something to kind of help it out. Well, if you look down there in the picture on the bottom right, you're going to see a picture of a cell membrane, which I recognize we haven't described yet. We're going to get there. Uh, you're going to see all these little, look like little balls, little tails dangling off of them. That's the membrane. Uh, we're at the bottom where it says intracellular space. That's the inside of the cell. Okay, so that membrane would wrap around in a big circle or whatever around the whole cell. The extracellular space is the area outside the cell. Um, one last thing I want to mention before we go any further is that in every single one of these pictures we're looking at, <laughs> time to go to class, you have to assume that there's water, water everywhere. There's water outside the cell, there's water inside the cell. Okay, and the little dots that we're showing you, those little dots are not the water. Those little dots are something else, like some other substance that's moving. Okay, like maybe it's oxygen or carbon dioxide or steroids or something like that that's moving through those proteins, so or the cell membrane. Now, if you see that there that in the picture, there's a big green thing spanning the whole width of the membrane. That's known as a channel protein. And it's a special shaped protein that, that spans and makes the little bridge so that certain things can pass through. So these things still diffuse through the cell membrane very easily, uh, but they have to go through a special protein that get help to get through. But it requires no energy. Okay, so this is still just diffusion. All right, so follow me. Wow, okay. <laughs> so, um, uh, diffusion, simple diffusion, facilitated diffusion, all without energy. The next piece here uh, is where it's going to get a little more complex. This is osmosis. Now osmosis, once again, does not require energy. It is still diffusion. It's just kind of a special type of diffusion in a way. So we give it a special name, okay? And what we're going to ask you to do on the quiz is to tell the difference between 
simple diffusion versus osmosis. So, so really try to get a handle, as we're talking here, on how osmosis differs than just this simple diffusion thing, okay? So first off, osmosis, the technical definition here, is that it is the diffusion of water through a selectively permeable membrane. Let's break that down. So first off, water is what's moving. It's not salt, it's not sugar, it's not anything else. Water is the thing that's doing the moving. And what's it moving across? It's moving across a membrane. But not just any membrane, it's moving across a membrane that's selective. So this membrane only allows certain stuff through. For instance, water, okay? The other stuff, like maybe salt or sugar, can't get through. Okay, you have to understand that before we can go any further. It needs to have a selectively permeable membrane and it has to be water moving through that membrane for diffusion to be happening. That's how it's different than just regular old diffusion because regular old diffusion, maybe there's no membrane at all or we could be talking about just about anything moving from a high concentration to a low concentration. That's regular old diffusion. So let's talk osmosis here. Um, let's look here. Uh, in terms of osmosis, uh, if you look at this beaker sort of looking thing down below, there's two, there's two molecules there. There's little blue dots that are called water, and then there's uh, a little reddish, pinkish, bigger dot called sugar, okay? Then there's a membrane separating the two, okay? That, that's a selective membrane. This selective membrane is only, only going to let the water, the little blue dots, through, okay? Now let's look at the concentrations, not of water so much, but of the sugar, because that's what matters in osmosis. It's the stuff that can't get through the membrane that's going to determine which way the water is going to move. So if you look at that first picture, picture A there on the left, you're going to see that there's a whole bunch of sugar on the right side, isn't there? On the right side of that membrane, there's way more pink, red, pink dots than there, than there are on the other side. Don't even look at the water yet, okay? Now, now I want you to look at the spacing between those sugar molecules that what we would call a high concentration on the right side of that membrane in picture A compared to the spacing of the sugar molecules on the left side. Do you see on the right side there of picture A how there is a higher concentration of sugar and the sugars packed more tightly together because there's not as much water separating it? But on the left side of it, there's a lot more water separating it. Well, what would normally happen during diffusion is that sugar would spread back out to the other side, but now it can't because there's this Dargon membrane there that's going to prevent it from going across. However, the water can move, and it's going to do kind of a weird thing here. The water is going to evacuate. It's going to leave the left side of that beaker. It's going to go through that membrane, and it's going to try and spread out those sugar molecules to try and make it equal. Okay, so now when we look at the picture on the right, picture B, this is like the end of the stage here the water has actually fled from the left side of the container. It's gone through the membrane and it's filled up even higher on the right hand side, like against gravity even, like it went up high uh, because it had to spread out those sugar molecules. Notice that the sugar molecules didn't change in number on either side of the beaker, right? either side of the membrane, right? But their concentration did. In other words, they're more spread out now on the right. They're the same amount of spread out as they are on the left of the beaker, the left side of the, of the, of the uh, permeable membrane, right? So uh, kind of take it back for a second, look at it again. Um, it's trying to reach equilibrium, but the only way to do that is for the water to do it. And it looks weird because it like fills up the container, the right side of the container. I recognize that but it has to rush in to spread out those sugar molecules. I really hope that makes sense. Let's break it down again though, just in case you didn't get it. Let's look at it side by side right here. So osmosis. If you're asking yourself, for instance, on the paper or on the quiz that you're trying to do, is this thing that I'm being asked about osmosis or diffusion, right? The first question you need to ask yourself is, is water doing the moving? 
If water's moving, check, check that off, okay? Now the next question you answer is, is that water moving through a cell membrane, okay? If you can check that off, then we've got osmosis, okay? Uh, in osmosis, water is doing the moving through a membrane, through a selectively permeable membrane, usually a cell, um, and it's trying to balance out some molecules that can't get through that membrane, like maybe salt or something like that, okay? If it's simple diff diffusion, it could be literally anything that might be moving from an area of higher concentration to lower concentration. It could be moving through a membrane, but it doesn't have to be. Okay, so th there's, there's lots of ways to look at that. If you look at the picture on the bottom left there, uh, let's say, for instance, um, as one of your questions is going to put in your activity, uh, there's a student sitting next to you that just came from gym class. They forgot to shower, and you can tell. So you can smell them. So what are you smelling? You're smelling their molecules, their stink molecules that are come on, coming off of them and moving through the air. They are diffusing through the air from the area of high concentration, i.e. their body, um, towards you, an area where there aren't any, right? There's no membrane going on there. This is just the smell on the outside of their clothes that's kind of moving towards you, right? It's because there's an area of lower concentration. Um, what if we said something along the lines of like, uh, we've got like a raisin, for instance. So raisins come from dried up grapes. We know that grapes were once alive. So do raisins have cells? Yes, raisins have cells, as do grapes, okay? If we drop those grapes, say, in a glass of water, and the water rushes through the cell membranes and fills up the cells in the grapes, because grapes have high salt or high sugar concentration in them, or, or raisins I'm talking about. These raisins have high sugar in their cells. Well, to spread that sugar out, because it's very high concentration compared to water, if it's just fresh water, it doesn't have really any sugar in it, it's going to rush in there to spread the sugar out, and the raisin's going to plump up and swell up again. Okay, so that would be, of course, osmosis, because we've got a membrane, and we've got something that can't th move through the membrane like sugar and then we've got water that can move through the membrane to uh, change the concentration of water compared to salt or sugar okay so i really hope that made sense but look at these two pictures this slide really breaks it all down for you for the first part of your activity to answer the questions okay um, and hopefully you can very easily answer uh, the questions about uh, diffusion. Be careful if you're being asked about diffusion or osmosis though. If we're talking about diffusion, it's always going to be where's the highest concentration of, of whatever it is we're talking about and it's going to move to the lowest concentration. It's going to spread out to fill in the lower area, right? Okay, hopefully that made some sense. Let's dive into the cell membrane. So the cell membrane is made up of two layers of something we call a phospholipid. Okay, uh, you'll hear me refer to this as the phospholipid bilayer. So uh, let's break that down a little. Bilayer means two layers. So this is two layers of this stuff called phospholipid. Well, what's a lipid? Okay, well, lipids are fats. You just learned about that, right? We just learned about that in the last activity. So if you look at the picture down there in the, on the right-hand side, it's actually a blow-up of that phospholipid bilayer, which you see on the left. So the left picture, picture that as an entire cell, it would be totally closed off, and they cut it open so you could see inside the, the cell membrane, which is that lipid bilayer. And of course, there's water, water everywhere. There's water inside, there's water outside, and then there's a special layer this double layer that separates the cell from the actual outsides. But there's water everywhere. And remember, water can go through that layer. So uh, we look here at the blow up on the right, and I want you to notice that it looks like there's a whole bunch of like tennis balls on top, and they've got two little tails that dangle down. And on the bottom, it's the same thing in reverse. There's tennis balls with their heads pointing down and their tails pointing up. So the reason for this, the reason it looks this way is because the heads, those ball-shaped things, are what we call hydrophilic. They love water. 
they're water files. They, they absolutely love to be around water. So their head, the, the ball-shaped thing, points either towards the water on the inside of the cell or the water on the outside of the cell. Makes sense, right? The tails, on the other hand, the little two dangly bits there, they point towards the area where water is not. So they point towards uh, what we call the hydrophobic zone. They're, they, they don't like water. They're, they're water phobes. They're, they're terrified of it. So they point away from the water. So the tails point towards the inside, towards each other, and the heads point towards the water on the outside and the water on the inside of the cell. So um, the reason that it looks like this it, uh, causes us to call it um, or to name our model of the cell membrane the fluid mosaic model because it kind of looks like like almost a mosaic, like a weird pattern. And you have to think of those ball-shaped things, those little phospholipids, as they're flexible. They're floating around and moving around each other. Okay, so um, it's, it's kind of a fluid sort of a thing. And then as we're gonna see here in a minute, there's other things stuck on there too. There's little carbohydrate chains that are sticking off of the end of this thing. There's special channel proteins that span right between the entire one side to the other and let certain stuff through. Um, there's, there's a lot of stuff going on there, like cells need to communicate with one another, so there's special little dangly bits that can communicate between cells. There's all sorts of stuff. This is like a really simplified, broken down vision of this right here. Okay, so that's our model of the cell membrane, a phospholipid bilayer. I think those are the, the fats that make it up. Okay, now, why is the cell membrane called semi-permeable? It's called semi-permeable, which means a little bit permeable. It means it allows just certain things through. It doesn't let everything through. It means that it will allow things to diffuse through it as long as they are basically one of the following things. And I listed them for you here. You're not going to have to remember all of these. The only one that's really important is H2O. Okay? Because H2O can freely get from one side of the membrane to the other. Uh, but some other things that can are steroids, um, carbon dioxide can go in and out, oxygen can go in and out. So you're going to probably see a question uh, on your quiz there about um, oxygen or carbon dioxide moving uh, into or out of the, the cells in your lungs, right? Because you breathe this stuff in the air in or out. Um, it's got to move into your cells and out of your cells somehow, and of course it's got to go through the, the membrane, but would that be considered osmosis? Right? It's moving through a semi-permeable membrane, but aha, is it water? It's not water that's doing the moving. If carbon dioxide or oxygen are moving, we say that's diffusion, right? So oxygen molecules moving from the air sacs in your lungs across the cell membrane um, into your blood um, is just simple diffusion. It's, it's not actually osmosis. Osmosis is a peculiar thing that happens uh, when one thing can't get across and to even it out, water has to move. Right? I think we've talked about that quite a bit. Well, we're going to actually talk about it a little bit more, so hopefully it sinks in. Here we go. Uh, there are some different types of solutions that we'll talk about. There's something called isotonic, hypotonic, and hypertonic. The words kind of sound a little similar, uh, so let's break it all down for you here. This will also help you to understand um, what's going on with, with osmosis, okay? So um, in, in a sense here, what I'm talking about is osmosis by trying to talk about the concentrations of solutions. So let's, let's start here with isotonic. That's the easiest one. In an isotonic solution, the concentration of the solute, which is what's dissolved in the water, is the same inside the cell as it is out in the outside solution. So if you look at my three pictures here, the orangish thing that's got the white thing around it, that white thing that's surrounding it is the membrane, is the cell membrane, and the orangish thing is the cell. Okay, and it would go all the way around it. This is just like a tiny corner of the cell. So obviously it's surrounded all the way around by that. And then we've got some stuff here, some, uh, uh, some little green dots. And those little green dots, let's say they rep represent, um, let's say they represent sugar, okay? And sugar can't freely go through. It wasn't one of those things I listed, was it? Let's look back at the list. 
steroids, water, carbon dioxide, oxygen. Nope, sugar can't easily get through that membrane. That membrane's gonna block it, but water can. And like I told you, you gotta remember, water is everywhere. It's inside that cell in the orange part. It's outside in the blue part. That's water too. And those little green dots are sugar. Well, your cell just needs some sugar, okay? So there's some sugar inside, and it so happens, if you look at the spacing there, don't count the number of molecules, but look at how spread out they are. They're spread out the same amount, inside as well as outside. Okay, that's isotonic. What's going on inside of an isotonic solution? Well, water is still freely diffusing either way. It's going inside, it's going out, but it just keeps it nice and balanced like that. Okay, let's move on to a little more complex one. Here's a hypertonic. Hyper, like hyperactive, like too much energy. You've probably heard that before. Uh, is a situation like that bottom right hand picture. And in this situation, the watery area outside the cell, that solution, which has sugar dissolved in it, has way more sugar than it has water to spread it out. Can you see that, how much sugar there is over there? In comparison to how nice and spread out the sugar is inside the cell. So think about what's going to happen here. The, the sugar can't move. It can't go from inside the cell to outside. It can't go from outside to inside the cell, but the water can. So in order to spread that stuff out outside the cell there, the water is going to have to rush out of the cell. And it will. It will, it will rush out of the cell in order to spread out those sugar molecules, okay? And it will, it will kind of pull the molecules inside the cell a little closer together because there'll be less water. So what you would actually witness happening here would you would see the cell shrivel up because it's losing water. Ever wonder why uh, throwing salt on top of a slug would kill a slug? Well, you're causing the water to rush out of the cells in the slug to try and spread out the salt that's now all over top of the slug. So yeah, that's how it works to kill a slug, right? So that's a hypertonic solution that a cell happens to be sitting in, okay? Now let's look at a hypotonic. So if hyper is a whole bunch, hypo is less. Right, so we're talking about the solution on the left-hand side where you've got that blue area that's, that's water. And uh, there's, there's only one, there's one molecule out there, but there could be more than that. Um, but there's definitely more space of water out there than there is inside the cell. So inside the cell, in that hypotonic solution scenario, there's more sugar uh, packed tightly together inside the cell. So what has to happen to spread that sugar out? Because the sugar can't move water's going to rush in from the outside okay water's going to rush in from the outside it's going to fill up the cell the cell might actually fill up so much that it bursts it could kill the cell by by filling it up so much right um, in fact it may never actually be able to reach a full equilibrium because uh, there's just you know no way to spread those things out enough to achieve what we're trying to achieve here okay uh, so those are the three kind of ways that osmosis uh, operates there but do you see how that's kind of a, a type of diffusion, hopefully? Let's look at another picture of the same thing. Um, here's some blood cells, and uh, here's a solute, uh, whatever, maybe it's sugar again, uh, that's outside. They don't show you the picture of how much is inside the cell. They're just telling you, um, for instance, in an isotonic solution on the picture on the left there, that there's a, the, a, the same concentration inside as there is outside get it I mean there'd be there'd be equally spaced sugar molecules inside that cell you just can't see them so water is going to move in that picture both into and out of the cell it's going to just continually diffuse back and forth okay in the hypotonic one the one in the middle this is a, a dilute solution in other words there's less of that solute um, outside the cell than there is inside the cell okay so this is going to cause uh, water to rush into the cell to try and spread out all of those sugar molecules in there, and it's going to swell up the cell. It's going to get big and bulge outwards like that. And then finally, the picture on the right is hypertonic. Um, this is a high concentration, very hyper concentration of that solute, that sugar, outside the cell. There's, there's way more outside than there is inside, and that causes 
uh, the water to rush out of the cell to try and spread those molecules out. Now it's never going to achieve that, right? Because there's not enough water inside that little cell to spread those all that sugar out. But what will happen is that cell will become craniated. It will, it will shrink and crunch up like that, okay? So it'll look very different. Those blue arrows are the direction of water motion. Okay, we've belabored that enough. I hope that you understand it. I know it's a little complicated, but, but to try to tell the difference between diffusion and osmosis, okay? Let's turn now to the great active transport. Active transport is the transport of materials across that membrane that needs energy. You have to have some form of energy to pull this off. And the energy that the cell uses is ATP, adenosine triphosphate. And we're going to talk quite a bit about that more. It's the energy currency of the cell. If you can just remember the letters ATP, that's cell energy. Okay, this is movement, as we say, of materials against a concentration gradient. So if you think about simple diffusion, which is a type of passive transport, if you've got a whole bunch of molecules in one corner of the room or at the top of a hill and you let them go, you don't need any energy, they just spread out or they roll down the hill, right? But if you've got a whole bunch of molecules at the bottom of the hill and you need to get them to the top, um, that's really difficult. Okay, in other words, the, the picture at the right there, the act of transport is akin to having, say, um, a whole bunch of molecules uh, outside the cell, more so than you have inside the cell, so they want to come in, and you still need to get some more out of the cell. So how do you do that? Well, you need energy to force them out because they don't want to go out. You're pushing them against the gradient. You're pushing them to where there's already too much of them. Okay, you're, you're packing them into the cell or you're packing them out of the cell. So there's, there's two kind of types of this. Um, mostly we just talk about this in terms of molecular transport, but you don't need to remember these, these terms here so much. But uh, we'll go over both of them here. So in molecular transport, what's happening is small molecules are getting carried across the membranes by special proteins um, that are in the membrane. So they're, they're kind of like that channel protein that was uh, facilitating the diffusion but these things instead of just kind of being tubes that let stuff through these things act like pumps in other words they take energy and they grab a molecule and they push it through to one side or the other so let's take a look here uh, there's a picture of both passive and active transport we've already covered passive transport there's simple diffusion there on the left there's more molecules of something outside there's less inside and they can get through, they just pass right on through from high to low. Same thing with facilitated, there's more outside, there's less inside, and they just pass right on through, but they need to go through a special tube. Okay, that's facilitated diffusion. None of which requires any energy. And osmosis would be there too. Doesn't require any energy for water to move in and out. Now, active transport is another beast altogether. You've got a specialized protein that's there in the membrane again, this little phospholipid membrane, and you've got, uh, you don't have very much of this material outside the cell. It's something you need. Maybe it's sugar, and you need more inside the cell, but there's already more inside the cell than there is outside the cell. So the cell uses energy at the site of this protein to snap this thing open, nab one of these molecules, and then spit it back out onto the inside of the cell. And that's active transport, and it uses ATP. Cool? It's really a pretty simple concept, and that's really all we're going to say about active transport for now, except other than that it needs ATP. It needs energy. Okay? Let's talk about the bulk transport, the bulk movement of materials. So another thing that requires energy for a cell to do, and it will be obvious that this would require energy, is sometimes cells need to kind of take in gulps of things and spit out gulps of things. And we've got two words that describe this endocytosis and exocytosis. So in endocytosis, you're taking things inside, if that helps. So the cell, is, it forms a pocket. It, it, for, it, it forms something known as a vacuole, which is just like a little bubble around something. It surrounds some material, and it pinches this little pocket off and brings it inside. 
in exocytosis, stuff is exiting. It's excreting it. It's getting rid of it. So it's got this stuff it needs to release, or maybe it's some waste that it needs to get rid of. And so it surrounds this waste in a little bubble called a vacuole, and the bubble gets near the membrane, and then it opens up and spills it out. Right? And that, of course, requires energy to pull off. Let's look at a picture because it'll make more sense. In endocytosis, you've got an area along the membrane, the cell membrane there. Uh, the inside of the cell is labeled cytoplasm. That's the liquidy interior. The outside of the cell just says outside. It's white. Okay, there's water everywhere again. Okay, There's these molecules the cell wants, it needs, all these little pink things. And so what it does, maybe it's food, it surrounds it with part of the cell membrane. Check that out. And then the membrane comes together and pinches off. Right? That membrane's flexible. It can do that. And so now there's this cool little phospholipid membrane-y thing that's floating around inside the cell called a vesicle, and it's got this material in it that the cell can use. That, of course, required energy to pull off. And exocytosis, simply enough, is the exact opposite of that. You've got picture number one over there in that greenish material called the cytoplasm inside the cell, that liquid there. It's not really green and it's got a vesicle it's surrounded in a little bubble and that little bubble moves towards the membrane the membrane fuses with it and it opens up and it releases that material to the outside world so this might be material that the other cells need that other parts of your body's need like proteins and things like that the cells producing or it could be waste that the cell needs to get rid of if it's a single-celled organism okay so let's look at a picture of a single-celled organism so here's a Here's a uh, exocytosis and endocytosis. Um, exocytosis on, on the left there, you've got the membrane inside, the inside area is the pink, and the outside area is the blue. So the cell's got some waste material, and so it moves that material to the membrane, and it spits it out. Okay, the cell wants to take in this little green goober ball of stuff, so it surrounds it with this membrane, pinches it off, and brings that vesicle inside to do whatever it's going to do with it. Digest it, use it, right? Okay, so endocytosis, exocytosis. <laughs> I want to turn now to life and how we view uh, single-celled organisms compared to how we view like multi-celled organisms. So uh, remember that the cell is the basic unit of life. Um, in a unicellular organism, a single-celled creature, that's the whole thing. The whole cell is the entire organism. Um, so just like multi-celled creatures, uh, these single-celled creatures have to maintain a constant internal uh, physical and chemical uh, composition. They have to, their internal environment needs to kept, be kept stable. They can't suddenly have this inrush of too much salt or too much sugar or this outrush of materials that they need. And that ability to maintain that constant internal environment is known as homeostasis. And the cell membrane is really the, the key that allows the cell to do that. Right? And single-celled creatures do what, what many of the things that we do. They, they grow, they respond to their environment, they use energy, uh, and they, of course, have to reproduce. Right now, let's uh, kind of move forward to uh, how multi-celled organisms work. In a multi-celled organism, cells become specialized. Um, even even in simple multi-celled organisms, cells differentiate into different roles into different parts of the organism. So some might help with maybe movement. Some might deal with reacting to the environment. Some might help produce substances that the organism needs. Uh, looking at, for instance, uh, some human cells, they've got a huge array of functions, right? Uh, there's red blood cells, there's, there's uh, egg cells, there's sperm cells, bone cells, nerve cells, muscle cells, right? All of these things perform very specific functions. If you think about a single-celled creature like an amoeba or a paramecium, like what we looked at down in lab, uh, a lot of these functions, that single cell has to perform all of them. Right? Uh, so there are some differences between multi-celled creatures and single-celled creatures. Uh, let's go through the levels of organization. You'll probably see this on a test question. So uh, multi-celled organisms have their cells organized into what are called tissues sometimes. Now a tissue 
is a group of similar cells that perform a certain function. Those tissues can then in turn be organized into something we call organs, which would be a group of tissues that work together to perform a particular function. And then those organs can be grouped together into whole systems that perform still yet a more particular function. Uh, let's look at an example because it will make way more sense to you here. If you're going to write something down, jot down the level of organization across the top of that diagram there. It's pretty simple. You've got a specialized cell. This single cell is called a muscle cell. If you have a bunch of them together, we call that a tissue. Henceforth, muscle tissue. If you have a bunch of muscle tissue that forms this thing called a heart, we call that an organ. So the heart is a specific organ. Um, the heart organ is part of a system known as the circulatory system, and it helps to circulate your blood, right? Uh, and then finally, that system, along with many other systems in your body, uh, make up the whole organism. See how that works? So it goes like this. It goes cell to tissue to organ to system to organism. Okay, so you can kind of see where the, where the root of the word organism comes from, right? It's a whole bunch of organs packed together in these different systems that make up this creature that we call an organism. Okay, if we want to put the whole levels of organization all together, it might look something like this. Starting from the most basic building block all the way on up, we would start with the subatomic particles, the protons, neutrons, and electrons that make up atoms. And then those atoms can be bonded together to create compounds or molecules. And then those compounds and molecules might make up something like an organelle inside of a cell, like so these small structures inside of cells, um, like the cytoskeleton or a chloroplast or a mitochondria, right, or a vacuole or the cell membrane. And all those bits and pieces, those organelles, they make up what we call cells. And of course, cells in multicelled creatures can make up tissues, and those tissues can make up organs, and the organs can make up organ systems, and then of course those make up organisms. And there you have it. Uh, that's the end of our chat for today. Go ahead and make sure you take your uh, quiz uh, online uh, on its learning. It's over osmosis and diffusion with a little bit in there about the cell membrane. Um, if you get confused, look back through these slides. It'll help you out. Uh, have a good one.